I mean, it is it is a digression, but Paul has a lot of those. So yeah. the textual evidence doesn't convince me that it's an interpolation. Yeah. Uh, Gordon and I went back and forth on this. Yeah. But it might it might be. I mean, I I can't I can't rule that out. But since I'm not convinced, I had to understand it in context in First Corinthians. And when Paul speaks of silence, he can't mean all kinds of silence because mm. I mean, three chapters earlier, they didn't have chapters back then, but, you know, earlier he'd right. spoken about women praying and prophesying. Yeah. The context is tongues and prophecy. Well, Paul obviously is not forbidding the women from praying and prophesying because he's already said they could do that as long as their heads are covered. I wish I could cover mine. I just shaved it and <laughs> looked rather empty up there. But um, also, the, the, but unless he's shifting the topic from silence in general to asking questions back to you know and, and there, there are grammatical connections so it doesn't seem like he's shifting the topic it seems like the kind of silence that he's addressing is asking questions and in ancient lecture contexts public lectures people interrupted with questions that was common hmm. now the question that raises for us if we're allowed to ask questions, is why would the women be asking questions in church more than anybody else? Of course, these are house churches, so even more than a lecture setting, you could have some some inter interaction. Yeah. And and there's two two things that make the most sense to me. One is that they were well in a in a public context conservative culture, not everybody agreed with this, but in conservative, mm -hmm. uh, traditional, especially Greek culture, but also Roman culture, traditionally, women were not supposed to speak in front of other women's husbands. Um, so that, that may, be, may be one issue. Uh, they certainly were not normally allowed to teach men uh, in, in antiquity. There, again, there are some exceptions to that, but they're they're so rare. Like I think we could find maybe half a dozen named teachers of men in rhetoric or philosophy over a thousand year period. Yeah. So uh, in in the Greek and Roman sphere, um, and then the other the other is well, yeah. The other is that. Women were unlearned compared to men yeah. normally. And most relevantly here, girls weren't taught to recite the Torah, although that would be true for all the Gentile members too. Yeah. But the, the, the women were more apt to ask unlearned questions, which actually those were the one kind of questions that ancient sources tell us were considered offensive in public oh, settings. Okay. So... Um, the solution to that would be that they should get some learning. And so Paul says, let them ask their husbands at home. And again, in, in 1 Timothy 2, which, you know, 1 Corinthians, the Corinthians couldn't flip over to 1 Timothy 2. It hadn't been written yet, so <laughs> they couldn't use that as background. But even in 1 Timothy 2, where Paul says, let them learn quietly and submissively. Well, that quietly and submissively was the expectation for all novices for learning, you know, male or female, whatever. Yeah. But what would jump out to ancient audiences may have been, let them learn. Because in a first century context, like Plutarch in his advice to bride and groom says, Pollyannas, take an interest in your wife's learning. And he, he says, I know that most men think women can't learn anything. Keep in mind that in, in, that, in that period, um, Greek men tended to be like, what, 12 years older than their wives. Mm. And so they often looked down on them as like children. And they, they would, um, they, anyway, Plutarch, you know, says this thing. I know most men don't think their wives can learn anything, but you really should invest in your wife's learning. And, and so that's like one of the most woman-friendly statements back then. And then he ruins it. He says, 
he says, because if left to themselves, women produce nothing but base passions and folly. So you better instruct her. Um, Paul is much nicer than any of them. So whether you're, yeah. I'm, you know, it, pretty much everybody knows I'm egalitarian, but whether you're egalitarian or complementarian, Paul is way beyond his culture in terms of yeah. respecting women. I mean, there were some people like him, but you know, he's yeah. he's way beyond the average. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, do you see do you see a trajectory in in Paul's thinking? Like, if if he were alive today, this came up when I was in seminary a lot. Do you think he would potentially be speaking? Is there enough room in his language on this topic? That if he were alive today, we could say he would maybe be speaking in more explicit language. Oh, I think I think so. I mean, yeah. my my of course I'm an egalitarian, so right. But but my my conclusions on the exegesis, in light of the cultural setting, uh, definitely nobody today would have the right to call Paul sexist. I think the only reason they can call him that is because they don't understand the context in which he was writing. But today, just from the things that he did write, I mean. Ephesians 5, 21 through 6, 9, where he deals with wives, children, and slaves, which were the household codes um, going back to Aristotle. He adapts them in significant ways. Most significant to me is that he frames this, only household code I know of from antiquity, with mutual submission. Yeah. Submitting yourselves one to another. It's just like elsewhere he says, uh, serve one another, be be like slaves to one another, bear one another's burdens. Well, yeah. submit to one another, he says, in the fear of God. And then he gives wives as an example. The word submission in verse 22 is borrowed from verse 21. And then at the end, when he's saying, you know, slaves obey your masters, he goes on and says, and you masters do the same things to them. So the, the codes are, are framed with mutual submission and that's not even talking about how he how he changes them from the, the cultural expectations addressing both the wives and the husbands and uh, and also in uh, Colossians 4 where he's he's talking about slaves and he says masters you treat you should treat them with equality and people don't want to take that literally but I mean <laughs> uh, and then then you also have first Timothy 2 in terms of that being a, a special situation, First and Second Timothy, that's the one set of letters written to a church where we specifically know that false teachers were targeting women. Like ah. First Timothy 5, you've got the, the widows who are spreading nonsense. Uh, it's probably a good way to translate the, uh, from, from house to house. Busy bodies. Um, and, and why would why would they target widows well they were the ones you know if you're going to have a house church they're the they're the one group of women that own houses why why target women at all well again we know about the education uh, available being being different on a, on average but way on average and then um in second timothy 3 6 the false teachers it specifically says are going around targeting women it's specifically said there. So now he does give an argument based on Adam and Eve, but one of the arguments he does is the same argument for head coverings. So just, you know, without going into the point of head coverings in antiquity, um, <laughs> if we don't take it universally there, we shouldn't take it universally in the other passage. And then the other one is about Eve being deceived. Does he use that always to symbolize all women? Well, elsewhere in Second Second Corinthians 11, he uses that is to say uh, all the Corinthians. He makes them an analogy, or even an analogy for all the Corinthians being deceived. So, when you've got so many passages, Romans 16, he commends twice as many women for their ministry as men. Um, Philippians 4, also he he commends. Uh, well, he's not commending there, he's correcting, but he, he mentions positively uh, the past work together in ministry. Philippi and Rome were two of the places where women had the most opportunities in the ancient Mediterranean world. So it seems to me no surprise that that's where you had more women being involved in Paul's ministry than, say, in Ephesus or, or somewhere else. 
And I think that today where there are more opportunities culturally for women to think about what they can do for the Lord, I think it, anyway, I, I, I didn't mean to go off on all that. Uh, I love it. No, we love it, Dr. Keener. We've been talking about this on our podcast and we have a lot of female listeners who interact with our, you know, our episodes. And so I feel yeah. like we got, I feel like we, I feel like we got a two for one. If we're ever blessed enough to have you back, we're going to pick two topics to talk about. <laughs> Um, yeah. Doesn't he? Doesn't Absolutely. he? Doesn't Paul commend Phoebe and tell the Romans essentially do whatever you need to do to support her? I mean, I'm I'm paraphrasing, but yeah. And 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 so I mean, he's commending her. She's delivering the letter. Chances yeah. are, if they want to know what it means, who are they going to ask? Phoebe. Because uh, normally letter bearers would be asked about the you know the person sending. I have a number of references for that in antiquity, but. And again, I know there are people who disagree, and we can we can disagree respectfully and lovingly. We're brothers and sisters in in Christ. If we believe Jesus died for us and rose again, you know, yeah. um, and He's He's Lord. But also, I think the the two most common terms that Paul uses for his fellow workers are fellow worker and the Greek word diakonos, which can be translated minister or servant or something like that. In Romans. In Romans 16, he uses both of those for women. Yeah. Um, and also, uh, this one is debated uh, grammatically. The majority of scholars today would agree with John Chrysostom and some of the Greek fathers in seeing Romans 16, 7, Andronicus and Junia as apostles. Mm. Um, and the idea that Junia was a man, it's a contraction for the male name. That one just doesn't fly at all. But yeah. Um, and, and all the women who prophesy in the Bible. So again, I'm going off too much. I better go. But yeah, no, no, that's okay. Who yeah. Yeah. 